Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit, the newest and most reliable state-of-the-art time-traveling transportation service, is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Odyssey. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode two of the Ozymandias Project. Um, in today's episode, I had the chance to chat with Dr. David Shanker, who is currently an associate professor of classical studies and serves as the director of undergraduate studies at the University of Missouri. His primary research interests are in Greek tragedy and literature of the early fourth and fifth centuries and the dialogues of Plato. He also teaches a variety of courses, including classical mythology and the ancient Greek language. He is one of the most interesting people I have ever met, and I hope you will enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Uh, enjoy the episode, and I'll talk to you next time. Okay, so I'm really, really excited to be able to talk to you today because one of the first things that I wanted to ask was um, classics. Classics. What was it about classics that really sort of got your attention like why you could have chosen so many different things in the world why classics well it's not the greatest story really it, when i was in um, growing up in nashville tennessee i went to a school that required latin of every student starting in the eighth grade and um, it was an all-boys school and it was terribly restrictive and um Good education, but I was not very happy there. But one of the things that I found I could immerse myself in to escape the, the miseries of daily life was Latin grammar. It requires a sort, a sort of immersion. And uh, so I ended up doing really well in my Latin classes and stayed with it. And I was blessed. I was lucky to have excellent high school Latin teachers. Um, I thought, well, this is fun. I, I did really well in, in Latin right through high school. And then in my uh, because it was in my senior year uh, in high school, I took a translation test, and one of the prizes was cash money if you were willing to continue your study of classics in college. And I won a whopping, I think it was $50, and that was enough to make me continue. So I started up with Greek uh, when I went to college, and, and from there, again, uh, excellent teachers, um, and, and it was something that I enjoyed and something I did well at, and I had the luxury, uh, which I hope many students have now, of not thinking too much about what my careers were going to be. I was thinking about what I really enjoyed studying and what, uh, what I thought I could do well at, and, and that, was, that was studying Latin and Greek and related subjects, and um, I could go on from there. The story continues. Um, yeah, I mean, once I, once I graduated from college, uh, I was thinking about graduate school, but instead I taught Latin in a high school, uh, for one year because I wasn't sure that this was something I wanted to do as a, as a life pursuit. And it was a wonderful experience teaching Latin junior high and high school. And looking around at this high school where I was teaching, there were, there were several young guys like me who kept saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna to go to grad school. This is just temporary. But it was such a good life. I could see myself staying there. And the longer I waited, the harder it would be to go back to grad school. So, so I left after just one year, went to grad school and it's worked out since. Uh, but, but basically classics is something that I enjoyed and something that I did well at. And, and I find it so uh, all encompassing. Um, I mean, what we're doing is studying a particular geographical area and we're studying a time period and within the, the geography and the time we can study so many different things so it's it's really a wonderful wonderfully broad and wonderfully uh diverse so it's kept me interested all these years yeah so and it's it's interesting then that you didn't sort of make the choice to go right into grad school because I know a lot of people who are kind of struggling with that choice where they're like, you know, oh, well, maybe I should go out and make money in the world and get life experience or no, I, I know what I want to do and I want to go straight, uh, straight on. So I do I do love how, you know, you, you took that sort of um, break. Uh, and, and so 
you know, I find it really interesting. So if most of your experience, your early experience was in, in Latin, so then how did you go from that to now teaching primarily ancient Greek? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, in fact, since coming here to the University of Missouri, and I've been here almost 30 years, I think I've taught two Latin classes. Uh, part of that is, um, I mean, it's the typical order of learning languages in the United States. Uh, Greek is very rarely offered. I mean, Latin is not all that often offered, but it's offered a lot more frequently than Greek. So students tend to start out in Latin. And then, um, you know, I got to college, I started, started reading Greek. And when, even when I went to graduate school, when I started in grad school, I was, I was pretty evenly uh, divided between Greek and, and Latin. And there I happened to work with a couple of faculty members that I really admired. And my um, dissertation director, this is somebody I really wanted to work with. Uh, it's a man named Mark Griffith. He's still there at University of California, Berkeley, and um, an inspirational teacher. And I decided this is what I wanted to work on. Now, when I got out of grad school, uh, my first job was at a smaller school, Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. And there I was doing uh, almost as much Latin as, as Greek. Uh, but when I got to the University of Missouri, which is a, a larger program, there are, there's more specialization. Um, there, and there just happen to be more Latinists than Hellenists. And so, um, yeah, they, they needed me to teach Greek. And I've, I've really gone in that direction, uh, both in terms of research and teaching. And uh, I won't go as far as saying that Greek is a more interesting language, culture, literature than than Latin or Roman. No, I'm not going to go there. Uh, it just happens to be the direction that I took. Okay, I respect that, you know, and that's a, that's a very smart decision. Not, we don't want to start any classical bar fights, I suppose, over comparing two very different, but also very similar, ancient cultures. Um, so I kind of want to go back a little bit, though. Um, so you said you won that $50 sort of uh, scholarship prize. Um, so then, you know, you won that and then you said, okay, uh, I can, I can take this and study this in college. Um, so that process of choosing kind of which college to attend, where to go, what program, um, you know, how did you kind of go about that? Because I find that nowadays, most, you know, ancient disciplines, their programs are kind of not really accessible um, to most people. Um, when I came to Mizzou, I didn't know classics existed. I did not know it was a thing. I knew that it's what I wanted, um, but I couldn't describe that. So I went into anthro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a real problem. Um, and it's something that we're working on. Um, people don't know what, what we, our department is now called ancient Mediterranean studies. Uh, when you were here at Mizzou, it was called classical studies. Uh, neither of those is particularly transparent uh, exactly what it is that we're doing. And it's true that we get very few, I'll get back to me in a minute, but, it's, it's, but, but right now it's true that we get very few students who come into Mizzou knowing that they want to be majors in our department. Um, yes, we have a good relationship with a lot of the high school teachers, not just here in Columbia, but across the state in part since many of them are graduates from our program. And so, so if there are kids who are uh, high school students who are studying Latin or even studying mythology, studying, uh, uh, you know, like they, they read the Odyssey or the Iliad and they're particularly taken with that, the teachers might steer them toward our program and, and steer them toward a classics major. But we do not get very many of those at all. Most often what we do is get people probably like you, who come out of one of our introductory classes. They come in and they say, well, I'll take this class. And they realize, oh, there's a whole world there. There's a whole uh, discipline that I can find out about and study. So we, we take very seriously our introductory level classes like classical mythology. Um, we teach thousands of students in mythology every year. Well, maybe it's more than a thousand anyway. And, and out of that group, we hope that some will come and take the languages and, and then become majors. Um, yeah, for me, I came from that unusual situation of, of having taken a lot of Latin in high school. And then also, um, well, it's, I had a much easier path than many. 
uh, because I had no choice about where to go to school. Um, my dad was teaching at Vanderbilt University and I got a free ride and that was hard to turn down. And so I, I, never, I never said, no, I'm going to resist. I'm going to rebel against my, my uh, paternal obligations. No, I said, okay, fine, whatever. Uh, and I went to Vanderbilt and it was it, well, a great classics program uh, then and now. And um, I was very happy with it. It is hard though. And I think it's become increasingly difficult as people are much more mobile and people are much more pressured to make just the right choice uh, for college. I know it was harder for my kids when they chose their colleges, uh, going through that process with them, much harder than it was for me. <clears throat> but the, the bottom line is, is getting the word out, letting people know who we are and what we, what we have to offer and why it's valuable so that we can get more students coming right in from high school. Uh, it's hard to start the languages in college, to start Latin or Greek, and to get to a point that's uh, uh, of real proficiency. I mean, a lot of people do, but it's so much easier if they come in with some background already and they, they're, they're interested in what we're doing and they start up with us in the, in the freshman year. And I guess it's almost a little bit of an advantage, I would say, for classics, because everyone loves Greek mythology. You know, it's just, it's so pervasive in our culture, whether it's some kind of reference, you know, in a, in a book, in a film, um, or even like a popular saying, oh, it's my Achilles heel. I'm so bad at math. Um, yeah. So, you know, there is that sort of built-in advantage. So even if, you know, someone were to not really know what classics was as a discipline, you know, you could say, oh, well, there's like a basic mythology course that sounds cool. I, I've always loved it. So I'll take it, which is kind of what I did when I, when I was a freshman, I, um, I actually didn't know there was a mythology course at the time. So uh, a girl I lived in like the dorm with, uh, she on day one of classes, she was like, Oh, I have to go take this mythology class. And I'm so bad at it. Will somebody come with me, please. I don't want to go alone. And so my ears perked up and I just said, Oh, I I'll go. I love mythology. I didn't know there was a class. So uh, long story short, I ended up going to the class, sitting through a whole class, loving it, and going up to the professor and just saying, so, um, yeah, can I, can I get in this class, please? Like, I really want to stay. Um, and luckily, he was very gracious and just said, sure, we'll pick up, we pick up straight students all the time, join us. That's, that's not the conventional way of joining a class, Lexi, I guess you know that, but uh, I'm glad it worked. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, no, I did, I mean, luckily, I had the benefit of pleading ignorance as a freshman, being like, I don't know how anything works, I'm just gonna do it. Um, luckily, I met one of my best friends who was a junior at the time, and so she just said, well, you can go up and ask for a permission number, and he'll, you know, slip it to you, and then you're, you're fine. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no. So, I mean, it was, it's really interesting how you find things. Um, and that, that happens quite a lot. And I'll tell you what, Lexi, one of the things that we're very conscious of is trying not to kill that interest. I mean, there are a lot of people who come in. Um, yeah, maybe they saw Gladiator. Maybe they, they've seen Clash of the Titans or, or the movie Troy or, or the one that we get increasingly. Students are hesitant to admit it. But but they do finally, but students are saying, yeah, I read the Percy Jackson books. And I think that's great. I mean, I don't know why people are so hesitant. It's like, like it's a, it's a non-academic thing or something. So they don't want to admit it, but, but, um, but I've read a couple of them, um, mostly prompted by students. It was just, uh, just a year ago, a student was doing a project on the Odyssey or versions of the Odyssey. And he said he wanted to do something on a sort of a treatment of an Odyssey-like story in Percy Jackson, and he was going to use one of the books. And I said, okay, I should probably read that book. And, and he told me the title. So I went to the public library, and I was thinking it would be some little thin, you know, young adult paperback. This thing was huge. Uh, I don't know, it was about 500 pages. But, but it was a real page turner. I really enjoyed it. And by the time I got to the end of it, um, I looked up the author, Rick Riordan, which I think is how you pronounce it, Rick Riordan. I looked him up on the internet and uh, thinking, we got to invite this guy to campus to give a talk because uh, everybody loves him. Well, they're under the frequently asked questions. Will I come to your campus to give a talk? Answer, no, because I'm too busy writing my next Percy Jackson book. Um, <laughs> so I gave up on that one right away. But, but, I love that. I love it when people come in with an interest. And yes, we have to make sure we don't turn it into some dry as dust academic subject that, that turns people off, but rather to, to build on that interest and, um, and make them want to go further with it.
Yeah, no, I, and I love how you brought in Percy Jackson because I literally was about to ask, you know, oh, well, you know, as as a professor of classics and so probably having talked to a bunch of undergrads, you know, about getting into the program or, or you know, their interests, I, I, I've got to ask, though, you know, is it kind of very common to have a student basically just say, oh, I know this popular reference and this one and this one and this one and they all have Greek and so I'm very curious or is that you know, maybe not the majority of ways people get interested. Well, and it really does vary. And I have to be careful because there are always students in a mythology class. I mean, it's, it's an entry level class and in, a, in an entry level class, I am not supposed to presume very much background knowledge. So I have to be careful because there are people who have never heard of Zeus, never heard of Athena, never heard of Apollo, and that's fine. Whereas there are others out there who have run across all these, these things. And I think those, uh, in my experience, at least the Percy Jackson books really do get things right for the most part. Uh, so students come in with a pretty good sense of uh, the character of some of these gods and goddesses or, or some of the, the basic outline of some of the stories. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is a real mix. And one of the things that I, well, when I teach mythology, it's, almost always as a writing intensive course, which involves lectures to large groups on Monday and Wednesday. And then Friday, we break out into smaller discussion groups. And it's within that discussion group that I really find out who knows what. And one of the things that's most rewarding for me, I think, is when one student is able to respond to another student and talk to that student and say, well, this is my background with it and I can, I can help you out with that. And, and so there's, um, there's some sort of uh, collaborative teaching and learning going on there among the students. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I remember being in classes where I would talk to students who weren't necessarily majors or minors. Um, and yet I would always have something fun to talk about because they've seen Troy with Brad Pitt in it, um, or, or something, uh, Greek or Roman. Um, and it's, it's interesting because things like Percy Jackson are so important to getting young people into the subject, introducing them sort of. Um, but kind of as an educator yourself, you know, how do you deal with things that are so great, like these books and some of these films, um, not getting all the details correct? You know, how do you, you know, find trying to say, okay, well, I, I love that you think this way about Zeus or Poseidon, uh, but this is highly fictionalized for the purpose of this specific book series. That's yeah. not a thing. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And the way I approach it is by thinking about uh, the ancient versions of these myths. I mean, when I teach mythology, uh, I tend to use uh, primary sources. So, so for, for the, the origin of the, the world, the origin of the cosmos, the universe, we read Hesiod. Um, we read the Homeric hymns for presentations of the way certain gods and goddesses are thought of. We read some of the tragedies, uh, fifth century Athenian tragedies for their portrayal of, of gods, goddesses, their interaction with heroes. Um, you know, they're not really good accessible uh, sources for all of the stories we want to get across. But, but by doing that, by using these, these original uh, versions, source materials, what the students are getting is one version of a story. And, and what I'd like to point out to them is that there are, in antiquity, uh, several different versions. I mean, right there, the, one of the first things we talk about is, um, is Zeus and his, his battle with Typhaeus, or, or Typhon, depending on how you want to translate. And um, Hesiod has him completely, single-handedly, destroying this monster so that he can he, Zeus, can then take over and be completely in charge. Well, there's this other version um, that, that we have from Apollodorus, who was a, uh, well, we, we call him Apollodorus. It was kind of a, um, a, a collector of myths that probably comes from the Hellenistic period at earliest. Anyway, uh, it's not literary by any means. It's just a collection of stories. Apollodorus tells us that Zeus and Typhaeus were battling, and Typhaeus actually had Zeus uh, defeated. And he stripped out all of Zeus's sinews and put them in a bag. 
try to envision that. Anyway, and so there is Zeus lying there like a, bag, like, like a pile of jelly without any sinews holding him together. And it's Hermes who comes along and, and tricks Typhaeus, defeats Typhaeus somehow, gets those sinews back, puts them into Zeus, and only then does Zeus win. Well, Hesiod doesn't want any part of that story uh, because it doesn't fit his narrative of Zeus being completely untouchable and completely in charge. But it's there. Um, I mean, for most of these, these myths that we have, there is a basic narrative, there's a basic plot, you know. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Greeks defeat the Trojans, uh, they use the Trojan horse, uh, you know, things like that. You can't change that, but different authors will have different takes, they'll emphasize different things. So, to get back to your question, what I talk, I talk about these modern takes, these modern adaptations as versions um, or adaptations that are, I mean, who's to say that they're, I'm not going to say that they are wrong, they're different. They don't match up with the ancient sources. If they're meant to be a, a direct presentation of the ancient sources, they're wrong. But most often what they're trying to do is use that material in a new way to be entertaining and to speak to a different generation and a different audience. So even Disney's Hercules, I'll say, okay, it's just crazy. I mean, the, the, the blending and the mishmash of, of mythological stories and characters. I, I mean, there's a Philoctetes in there as, as a crazy, as some little, anyway. Um, I think they made that, him a satyr. <laughs> yeah, he's a satyr. Okay, so, so fine. I say, great, you know, whatever. It's a version. Um, and this is something that, that comes up often when in, in reception studies. We talk about how how these stories, how these plays, how these 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 epics, um, the, the the myths, how they're used in later generations. Um, the question is not so much in reception studies how faithful are they to the original, but rather how are they using that original to speak to a different time period and a different different context. So I think it's yeah. Fun. Yeah, I mean, and, and I've heard, you know, similar sort of answers where, okay, obviously, it's never going to be a perfect representation, or if they try to be, they're going to try to say we've tried to get this, you know, to be as close to the original source material as possible. Um, but is there anything, so obviously, we have wildly different portrayals, like Disney's Hercules, where they portray Zeus as this loving father and hair, and they're this sort of beautiful little family of three, which is just not real. Um, but what about things that are a bit closer, um, but really would wildly throw off like one crucial sort of perception of timing? So the example I can think of is any sort of adaptation of the Iliad, you know, in, in terms of whether it's the Brad Pitt Troy or the new Netflix miniseries, Troy Fall of the City. Um, you know, they show us all the sequence of events, kind of, uh, give or take a few. But I've found that neither of them mention the fact that the entire poem is like a few days in year nine of this 10-year war because most people I talk to they just go oh yeah it's like a 10-year war so how did all these things happen you know in in all that time and, and what we're seeing is such a truncated um you know and I go well it's they're not cramming 10 years into you know a hour and 45 minute movie um yeah yeah, I, I see what you mean. It, it can be misleading. Um, I don't know the new Netflix series. Uh, and yes, I, sh I should apologize now for being such a complete uh, ignoramus when it comes to, to pop culture generally. But um, say the, the Brad Pitt movie, uh, or even before that, there was something on television. There was a, there was a, a, a version of the Iliad that started in Sparta with the abduction of Helen uh, by Paris from, from you know, she's, she's the wife of Menelaus um, and she was, she was in, in Sparta and she, she, was, she was taken away from there. Um, but they show her jumping on, leaving Menelaus's palace and running out to the seashore and jumping on a boat. Well, Sparta is completely landlocked and it just, it just is, is, is bizarre that they would show something like that. Or I don't remember the Troy movie with Brad Pitt all that well, but wasn't there wasn't it the case that um, in the the duel between Paris and Menelaus, it goes completely against whatever happens in, in the Iliad. Things just don't work out the way they they do in the Iliad. Um, and there are a few things like that 
one thing that I did notice and that, that I think that the, uh, the director um, was, was conscious of doing, he left the gods out of it pretty much, uh, in part because gods are really hard to do in modern culture. How do you, how do you, how do you present them? You know, in the Iliad, the book one, we go from, from the battlefield up to, to Mount Olympus uh, and we see what's going on up there or we constantly have the interaction between the gods and the humans, and that's completely left out. I think there might be one shot of a temple of Apollo uh, or something like that, but, but it's, it, gives a, um, it gives a sort of a, a skewed version of, of events. Um, and that, that can be a, l- a little unsettling and a little surprising, particularly when it's done well. I mean, this is, this is what happens with, with good literature or good film or, or good, good theater, you get so caught up in the moment that at least you should be so caught up in the moment, according to some theorists, that, that you're not thinking about it. You're not, you're not assessing it. Um, uh, the, the, the rhetorician, the fifth century rhetorician Gorgias said that the, the, when it comes to theater, the wisest people are the ones who are deceived uh, because they allow themselves to get completely involved in the theater and engaged in the theater. And if you're not allowing yourself to do that, if you're constantly thinking, wait a minute, this isn't right, this isn't right, then either the production is not a success or you're being the wrong kind of audience member. I don't know. That's so interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so I guess, you know, it's uh, most people I talk to are more familiar with the Brad Pitt Troy, not so much the Netflix miniseries Troy Fall of the City. But I did want to bring it because I think it plays to just the larger idea of getting these ancient stories out to the modern a modern audience um is they cast and i don't know if it was a deliberate choice or just it was who was good um but they had a black actor cast as achilles as patroclus um and they even cast a black zeus so you know as someone who studied this stuff but also is cognizant of modern society and getting people involved uh, and interested, you know. Um, Because we don't have a lot of evidence for so much of history, you know, is it possible to be able to look at something like that Netflix series and say, oh, sure, Achilles could be Black. That's that's not just, you know, catering to the will of the modern people um, or a Black Zeus, you know, Um, because I know a lot of people might say they have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah, and it, I think it's fine. In fact, there was there was a British series um, a few years back uh, about I, I I don't know it I didn't see it I just saw some response to it where there was a it was a Roman story and there were there were some black Romans uh, and people got very upset about it uh, but I think it's fine and for for a couple of reasons um, one very specifically <clears throat> with the gods when they would go on vacation the place that they always wanted to go was to Ethiopia, what they called Ethiopia, which was kind of the, the, the catch-all term for, for black Africa um, in the ancient world. Um, so um, there, there was this, this, this feeling that whatever was going on down there was, was, was a wonderful thing uh, and, and something to be admired, and, and maybe there were representatives from there. But more generally, more generally what I would say is that um, it's a mistake to think of Greek culture, Greek literature, Greek philosophy, Greek ideas as being what we think of now as European um, or, or Northern European. I mean, this, this sense of, of a Europe that is, that is white um, is one that was most, and, and as it's applied to, to ancient Greece, is one that was developed, it seems, uh, in, in the 19th century into, into the 20th century. Um, I mean, the Greeks thought of themselves as being a Mediterranean people. That is, uh, well, Plato talks about the Greeks as being uh, situated with, with relation to the Mediterranean Sea, like frogs around the pond. There, there are Greeks everywhere. It's not just in what we think of now as being uh, a continent or, or mainland or, or even with, with the islands, uh, uh, the country of Greece. Rather, there were Greeks scattered all around the Mediterranean. So, so they're in the, the, what we think of now as the Near East. They're, they're down on the North, North Shore, uh, Northern Africa. Um, and so there is, there's much more of a, a cultural interplay with Semitic peoples, with, with African peoples, um, what we think of as Semitic and African peoples. And, and uh, it's hard to say, there was not a lot of consciousness 
uh, as far as, as I know, about skin color or about um, uh, differences. But what we do know is that, that the, there was um, awareness of, of cultures outside of what we now think of as Greece. Herodotus is always talking about the ancient cultures of Egypt and how the Greeks have borrowed so much from them. Uh, so this is something that, that we are very, there are many people who are very keenly trying to promote the fact that um, ancient Greece was not white European uh, values, culture, settlement, whatever. So putting those, uh, making Achilles black, uh, some of the other uh, characters black, fine. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know. Or making Zeus black. Um, I mean, this happens a lot in Christian context too, depending on what church you go to, you see a different color uh, Jesus or, or, or God portrayal. Yeah, I, I find it really interesting how some people just get so angry and I'm like, but I don't understand why, um, you know. Uh, One more thing, Lexi, maybe you've heard the, um, the big, uh, um, well, kerfluffle, it's more than that, um, over the, the painting of ancient statues. Uh, well, we see, we see Greek and Roman statuary now in a museum. They're white marble. But what we know from little bits and pieces that have been preserved, and the more that they're studied, the more we realize that these things were painted. Um, the, the architectural sculpture was painted. And they were painted bright, garish colors. I mean, to our taste, to my taste. Um, they're just wild. And when this was reported, some people got very upset. How can you say that they weren't all white statue because these statues, they're the basis of our great white historical culture. And, and we, the great white race, would never do something like that. And, um, and it's, it's often coming from the, the, uh, the angle of these uh, people who want to use the ancient world, the ancient Greeks as a basis for some sort of, some sort of bizarre white supremacist movement that they're, they're getting, getting upset. So one of my colleagues at, at the University of Iowa who published on the coloring of the statues, she was getting death threats. Uh, people were taking it very seriously. Yeah. Oh my. And, and it's so interesting because I can think off the top of my head of so many different cultural topics that would get people, you know, to, you know, almost send them into, into fist fights. Um, but the color of ancient Greco-Roman statuary uh, is something we just don't think about. And, and I do love that you, you brought it around to, yes, these things were painted in psychedelically bright colors and, um, and people freak out when they see that and they just go, oh, that's so ugly or for whatever mm -hmm. reason, they just have that reaction. Um, and so I think that kind of gets to the heart of, of what I wanted to ask, which is, you know, so how important then is it to really make a concerted effort to, to educate more people sort of about the, the reality so we can sort of combat using these ancient cultures, these ancient statues and this perception we have to combat these white supremacist movements and all these people who think that, oh, this is just sort of my perfect little society. And obviously anyone who doesn't look like me doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are a couple, a couple of things there in what you said and a couple of possible responses. One is, um, um, well, I can go back to the, uh, I think it was in the nineties. Uh, there was a man named Martin Bernal, who was a, a sinologist, a, a study of, of uh, a student of China, Chinese language, Chinese history. But he got interested in the linguistic basis of, of uh, the Greek language. And he wrote a series of volumes, uh, Black Athena. It came out in three volumes, extremely dense and not always all that well argued. But the general point was that the Greeks were this, this pan-Mediterranean people, and they were borrowing from all these different places. These books came out, and, and there was a huge response, well, huge within the field of classics, at least, uh, but also people I knew who were not classicists who would come up to me and say, so what do you think about these Black Athena books? Um, well, I'll admit, I've never made it all the way through all three volumes, and I don't know anybody who has. They're really dense, and they're really, um, uh, but anyway, they, but his point was that, that um, we need to be aware of all these many influences on the ancient Greeks. It was mostly, it, it was not well received, that, that, that idea, 
uh, at the time, but increasingly it has been. Increasingly, people are, are focusing on the fact that we're dealing with this whole Mediterranean culture. That's one of the reasons we wanted to change our departmental name to become Ancient Mediterranean Studies rather than, than Classical Studies. But there's something else. There, there are at least two other ways that we can, we can fight against this, this attitude that this is the, the province of, of uh, white people. And certainly it has been. I mean, before I get into those two prongs, it is true that um, in the history of colonialism, um, the classics have often been used as a kind of a, a, a tool, almost a club, or, or at least a, a demarcating device so that if you knew Latin and Greek, you're one of the insiders, you're one of the, 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 the top group. And, uh, and these people that were colonizing, say in Africa, they couldn't possibly learn Latin and Greek, so they're uncivilized, and therefore we have every right to, to take all of their resources and to rule over them politically. Um, and to impose upon them our educational system. And to the extent that they're able to, to learn Latin and Greek or, or Latin and Greek literature culture, we're going to force it on them. Anyway, so there, there's a history of, of classics being used uh, in ways that, that are not all that positive. But in addition to the Black Athena movement that recognizes the sort of the, um, influence of all the Mediterranean cultures, there's also been a movement to recognize Black classicists, that is, people who have succeeded in the field. Um, one of the first purely American poets, I guess you can call her purely, Phyllis Wheatley, an African uh, African American, not by choice, she was brought over as a slave, and she learned Latin and she started writing poetry, but she was one who was um, um, uh, one of the first African Americans to be a, uh, recognized as somebody who can manage Latin and Greek. And there's now um, uh, further recognition of the fact that there have been, right throughout the history of the United States, African Americans who have succeeded in and contributed to the study of, of Latin and Greek. But so, a, go ahead. So it's just it's interesting because that that sparked a, a, a question that I guess I you know so maybe would not have thought of on my own. But it's just in thinking of how you know the, these ancient cultures they aren't just the province of white people as much as we like to think they are. So, some people may. Um, you know, could this maybe be one of the reasons behind kind of the continued, at least in this country, I don't know about others, but the sort of defunding and deprioritization of, you know, the ancient disciplines like classics and Egyptology or Assyriology, because I keep getting so disheartened by every year we look at, you know, humanities and arts funding. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they just say, I'm sorry, you, you guys are just sort of unimportant and, um, I know that when we combined the departments at Mizzou in my senior year, um, you know, at the time I just didn't really have perspective and I just was like, oh, this is the worst thing to ever happen. You know, I, th this is horrible. Why is this happening? Um, you know, and, and could it maybe be part of maybe not, I don't know if anyone would ever admit it or say it, but you know, this sort of the undertones of, well, now that it's shifting away and people don't want to just see it as a, a white thing, let's strip some funding so we can't teach more people and yeah. sort of deconstruct their idealized version of ancient Greece? That, it's, it's a very interesting question. And what I would say is, um, if those who were funding education, if those who were, who were deciding where the funds were being channeled within an academic setting, if they were enlightened enough it, to see that there was this history of uh, sort of a negative history, then they might be doing that. This is sort of a roundabout way of saying that, in fact, in the past, um, the, the, the perception of classics as sort of a bastion of, of uh, Western cultural heritage, that's been something that's been seen as a positive. That's been something that people latch on to and say, well, we're not giving up. You know, you might have your women's studies, you might have your black studies, you might have your, your gay and lesbian studies, but we are going to stick with our classics program because that is holding on to our old values. 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable thing to accept money from people who are saying that, <laughs> who, are, who are kind of funding us for the wrong reasons and saying, you know, you're, you're going to defend the values of the great white way. It's, uh, that's been in the past, I hope. It is changing. It is changing, I think, as there is a recognition that we all need to be more inclusive and more diversified. And, um, and I do think that, that classics has been a self-aware enough discipline, largely speaking, to, to um, I don't know if we're at the forefront of some of these changes, or a recognition that there needs to be more diversity and inclusion, but we are certainly responding and doing things now. So, so I don't think that the, the, the funding problem is, is, is related to, to that in particular. Um, I, wish I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could say in a way that it was. That would suggest that people are more enlightened. But no, no. I think um, um, classics as a, as a rule is responding to some of these, these changes. And I'm hoping that as uh, the people with the funding, whether it's outside the institution or within inside the institution, recognize that and recognize the value of our contributions to diversity and inclusion and will then give us the kind of support that we need to continue in that trend. How's that? Yeah. Without answering? Does that get it? <laughs> I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I mean, and it's, you know, it is a really tough question. Um, one that I often think about because I often think about, you know, what we're seeing in society today is this huge push to get young people into STEM. You know, it's all about STEM. STEM people are going to, you know, solve the world's problems, which is great. We do need people in those fields. Very important. Um, but it is still very shocking to me how much I just hear, oh, you don't want to get a major in classics. You're never going to get a job. It's not relevant in any way, shape or form. You know, you just want to go to school and listen to some wild stories or, or something. Um, you know, so, so no wonder no one wants to fund you guys. But, you know, I don't I don't I don't think I can say, you know, I, I believe that. Um, you know, what would you say to someone who's like, you should totally just major in STEM instead of classics? Well, I have these conversations regularly, as you might imagine. Um, as the director of undergraduate studies, it's either students or the parents of students who, who speak to me and they say, why in the world should I or why in the world should my child be studying this stuff? And what can they do? What could they possibly do when they graduate with a classics degree? And my uh, initial response is to say, well, what I can do is tell you about what some people have, in fact, done, some of our majors. And they've done very well. And... Um, I mean, I could just go through the list. There's the obvious uh, uh, group of students who go on to graduate school, a very small group who continue in classics, um, slightly larger group who go into professional schools like law and medicine. And when we have uh, double majors in, in say, biology and, and classics, they tend to do extremely well. Uh, uh, this one student was back the other day, a bio classics double major, who said to me that at his, his med school interview, the interviewers were just so thrilled to have somebody who could talk about something interesting other than, than science, to have a well-rounded person. And, um, and in fact, a person who could uh, relate to human beings on such a broad level. But anyway, that's, that's a small group of people who go into any number of uh, uh, different areas, pharmaceutical sales, um, uh, advertising. Um, this one student who went into um, an internet startup uh, company and she knew very little about computers or had very uh, minimal computer skills, but she could communicate. She could write, she could speak. And the most important skill uh, we keep telling people about is critical thinking because most jobs these days are going to train people on the job. They want people who can solve problems and who can learn quickly and who can adapt to quickly changing times. And so, our students, we found, are able to do that, and they, they end up succeeding. Um, so, um, for example, in, in the business world, um, there's, a, there's a financial planner here in town who's always asking me if we have any classics majors that he can hire. Uh, he's looking for classics majors. He said, people coming out of the business school have been trained to do a task. What he wants is somebody who has been trained to think and to be creative and to, as I said before, respond to changing circumstances and communicate with people, persuade people of a point of view. Um, and so, um, so I think those are valuable skills. And, 
eminently transferable across a broad range of possibilities. Yeah, I would say I 100% agree. Also, because I truly, you know, I'm a product sort of of that because, you know, I don't know, I, I don't believe that I the whole time knew I didn't want to go on into a grad program. I thought maybe, you know, briefly for two years that I totally wanted to continue on and be a professor of classical studies myself. But um, kind of as, as life and time happened, I just sort of realized, well, I don't want to major in something else, but I don't know if this is really for me. So being one of those students who looked at um, politics, what I do now is uh always a, a good landing spot um for for classicists i've i've noticed and um yes boris johnson we don't always we don't always accept him as one of ours but yes he's a classic <laughs> the one we're one we're happier about is anthony fauci who was a classics major undergrad yes yeah and, i mean yeah. honestly i like to say you can if you scour hard enough you will find a classics major or someone with a double major anywhere i mean i don't know how proud or not proud we want to be of her now but i know that jk rowling at one point um was a classics major at uh, the university of edinburgh which is obviously why now her entire book series uh has so many classical references so many i i don't think i can right. actually count um so definitely definitely i would agree it's very applicable to so many different professions um perfect so uh, we're right, we're moving right along. Um, so I wanted to save these last 15 minutes uh, because I would, I pretty much love asking my guests to read the poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. Um, so I, yeah, so if you would, wouldn't mind, um, yes. if you could read the poem and then I would just love to get your thoughts on it because it's such a, um, a deeply layered poem uh, with so many different messages. Okay, here goes. Percy Shelley's Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Yes, a lovely poem. So two things about the poem before I talk about um, uh, one connection that I've made with it recently. One is, um, it's a timely poem. Um, I guess that's the thing about most good poems. They tend to speak to every time in, in a different way. But I mean, obviously it speaks to the, the, the transience of, of, of our own uh, egotistical view of ourselves. Uh, and the fact that we should never put ourselves up on a pedestal, we're all going to end up in the dust. Um, but, but the thing that, that really strikes me in this day and time is the need for humility. If you don't have humility, you end up looking silly. Um, everybody is going to be dust. Um, and everybody is going to have their downfall one of these days. And the more you prop yourself up and claim to be uh, king of kings, a stable genius, things like that. You're, you're headed for your downfall. Better to be humble, recognize the, uh, uh, the transience of life and, and your own shortcomings. So I like the poem for that. Now I have to point out one connection that uh, it kind of surprised me. So um, I, to get back to what we were talking about earlier and the, um, um, the, the view of classics and what it, what it encompasses these days. I've started work on a, a project on reception of Greek tragedy in particular, Greek tragedy as it is adapted and um, uh, translated, adapted, put into different forms, particularly in Africa 
and in the African diaspora. So I'm teaching a class called Black Dionysus, sort of building off that Black Athena idea and stealing my title from a book by Kevin Wetmore. But anyway, Black Dionysus, Greek drama in Africa and the African diaspora. Um, and, and it shows, I think, what it reveals to the students or makes clear to the students is that this legacy of Greece and Rome is not just open to white Europeans. Others have, have used it, others have accessed it. And one play that I read is a version of Sophocles' Antigone. Uh, Sophocles' Antigone is, is, is used so often. It's, it's, it's done by so many different cultures. It is the resistance play. If you're going to resist power, you're going to do a version of, it, of Sophocles' Antigone. So there's this play called Tegani, an African Antigone, by a Nigerian playwright named Femi Oshofisan. And in that play, we have an African Antigone whose name is Tegani, and she is standing up against colonial powers. I won't go into all the details, but there's also an appearance by the Greek Antigone. It's, uh, it's this, this um, uh, meta-theatrical moment where, where we have a character from outside the drama talking to a character inside the drama. Uh, it's really fairly sophisticated. Anyway, as they're talking together, the, the, the historical Antigone is testing the Nigerian Tagani to see if she's really got what it takes to stand up to power, to resist. And when she realizes that she does, that Tagani really has what it takes, they celebrate by reciting in unison this poem by Shelley, Ozymandias, within the play. They sort of go line by line. Um, and the poem in the play stands as a kind of a recognition that the high and mighty, those who think they're high and mighty, are headed for a fall. And the little guy can always survive over and against those who, who think that they're in power at any given time. So that's where I've encountered it recently. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, this is kind of a poem where I, f I find a lot of people maybe might be assigned to read it as part of an assignment, whether in an English class or at the collegiate level, some classics course. Um, and I, I just, I have always remembered and loved it. And I think that it's very true. I mean, if it's a really good poem, it really will be applicable all the time, anytime. Um, and sort of that ephemeral nature of political power, very fleeting, very, um, you know, you, you have to recognize that it's a group effort. You yourself cannot just fix all the problems and do everything alone. Um, and I think it's interesting because to me, when it talks about the, the shattered visage and the, the, the statue itself, um, the, the king, I mean, Ozymandias is really sort of the Greek name of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses II. And so what's interesting is, you know, the, the ancient pharaohs, they didn't build their own statues. So sometimes I read it and I think, well, this is also be grateful. I mean, we would know nothing about him. We wouldn't even have the statue, the broken statue, if it weren't for the artisan who created it for him. I mean, all he did was sort of commission it and say, I want you to build me a statue. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, because it's so relevant, because it has lessons about pride and greed, but also, you know, it's kind of a statement on politics in general. Do you think this poem really, you know, who, who in modern society really now would benefit most from reading this poem and not just reading it to read it, but sort of hopefully reading it and taking lessons from it. You want names? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> sort of, no. you, can, it can, you can be as general or specific as you would like. No. Um, um, so uh, let me go in a roundabout way. I recently read um, the, the, the memoir, the autobiography of Nelson Mandela, who talks about leadership. Um, what is that called? I, I, I can't remember the name of it just now. It's a famous book. Anyway, um, he, he talks about leadership as involving listening. And uh, it, well, it's where Obama got a lot of his, his ideas about um, that he was much maligned for talking about leading from, from behind or, or not, uh, not necessarily charging to the front. Um, maybe not building a, uh, 
a, a, a multi-story tower with your name on it in, in the middle <laughs> of a city or a, or, or a, a casino that's going to go bankrupt. There's Ozymandias, uh, a bankrupt casino in Atlantic City with, with, uh, uh, with a name all over it, you know, say, look on my works, ye mighty. Well, it's, it's now a wreck. It's now a ruin. Um, a little more self-awareness, a little humility, a little, a little listening by, by those in power uh, would be a good idea. But I will say, too, that it's really important for, so I'm in a position of power. Um, as an educator, I walk into a classroom and I've got considerable power. Um, and I have to remember that um, I am there only by the grace of the presence of the students, that, that if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be around. Uh, and, and it's not just that they're, the, that they're funding my position, but also I have a lot to learn from them as well. Uh, so I think this could apply to, um, to, to anybody in power to, as a reminder about, about pride and, and a recognition of, well, like you said, the, the, the little guys, the, the, the masses, the, the demos, the people who are going to uh, make things last, make sure that, that, that some of us are remembered, um, that we make some sort of contribution. Yeah, and do you think, because I don't remember doing this before college, personally, uh, do you think, you know, maybe sort of teaching or, or having kids read this poem, even as young as middle school or high school, would, would really benefit their development? Um, you know, who, who knows at that age if I would have sort of, you know, read it and been like, oh, this is so powerful, or just would have said, oh, it's a cool sounding sonnet whatever. Um, but, you know, c can we gain anything maybe from trying to sort of start the population young and teaching them? Yeah, maybe so. I, I don't know about uh, psychological development as much. I, what, I, what I've heard is that uh, kids go through a stage where they are incredibly self-focused, uh, self-oriented. Self, uh, and uh, it might not play as well with people who are unable to, but, but you know, unable to recognize the world outside them, but maybe it would take something like this to, uh, to encourage that. Sure. This is, it's so important. Um, with, I mean, sure, start them young, teach them about kindness, teaching them about, about the world around them, uh, teaching them about uh, models other than those, um, than the self-centered power hungry that they often see. Um, Yesterday was October the 12th, which is celebrated in the United States as, as Columbus Day and is, is um, you know, elementary schools, you think of all the, all the celebrations. Well, uh, my wife used to teach fourth grade and, and so she would always celebrate on October 12th, Indigenous Peoples Days with the, with the fourth graders and read them an account of the arrival of Columbus an account from the perspective of one of the, the indigenous peoples of America, trying to get across to fourth graders, and these are what, 10 year olds, uh, uh, the idea that, that there are different perspectives and maybe thinking about those outside of ourselves uh, is, a, is a valuable thing. So sure, start them young. I say absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. So we like to hear, or I would like to hear, I would say. Yeah. Um, so in, in the last couple of minutes, where can people find you? You know, do you have any publications? Should people want to look into your personal research or do you have any, you know, scholarly recommendations? Um, if there's anything people would like to find on well, that? Yeah. Um, well, the most public facing work that I've done is a series of recorded lectures through the teaching company, um, which is called Masterpieces of Ancient Greek Literature. And uh, you know, so if you go buy it, I'll make some money off of it. But what you can do, you can find it, you can find it in the public library usually. Uh, um, what is it called? Uh, yeah, it's called The Teaching Company. I think that's what they're still called. They're under new. Uh, but I did this series of lectures, um, 36 lectures each a half hour. It was maybe ooh, 15 years ago. So I don't agree with everything that I said there, but, but it's, it's kind of fun. I can't stand to watch myself lecturing. Um, more recently, um, I was a co-editor of a companion to ancient Greek literature uh, that was published by Wiley Blackwell. And that has a, a series of really good, uh, good articles that are, that are um, about various aspects of, of Greek literature. Um, 
other than that, anybody's welcome to sit in on one of my classes if you're in Columbia, Missouri. Of course, now we're limited to the number we can fit into a classroom, but, uh, but you should all learn, everybody should learn ancient Greek. And uh, uh, I'm always willing to have uh, auditors sit in on my classes. Ah, uh, well, that's good to know because I, I think that that's one way to definitely make classics more accessible to people, even if they haven't decided, you know, okay, well, maybe this is something I should pursue. Um, just even given the chance to, to sit in and, and see someone work and see what they're all about, I think is a brilliant way to get people sort of uh, involved. Um, or even if they don't choose to actually pursue it, um, I, I hope that people will ha at least have learned something uh, from their experience that they can take into the, the rest of their lives. Um, and so I assume as, as well, in case people are thinking about maybe taking one of your classes or if they, you know, would like to go to Mizzou for grad school, for the grad program, or even as an undergrad, um, I'm, can people find you on the AMS website? Absolutely, yes. Uh, send me an email is fine. Schenker D S C H E N K E R D at Missouri edu. And I'm sure that you would love to hear from a lot of new people who maybe are listening to this podcast. I hope Absolutely. if you're listening to this podcast, please invest in the classics, support our faculty in the classics. They're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and it is a, a fabulous uh, subject to study at any stage of life. Uh, it's a beautiful journey. Um, so thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast. I mean, it's just, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I loved doing it when I was a student myself, just popping in uh, to say hello. Um, and so I, I, I do, I really thank you for coming on. Thank you, Lexi. It's been a lot of fun. Trireme Transit is now departing Ancient Odyssey. Next stop is Present Ponderings. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. 